Hello everybody and welcome to Starting Small Music. I'm Justin McCormick and you're about to hear a conversation with an artist, musician, and music industry professional on their journey and how they got to where they are today. At Starting Small, we like to take you on a journey uncovering the untold stories of your favorite songs and artists. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Just keep a smile on your face and it be okay. Try not to be bitter, you gotta do it either way. So when life throws a jab, you gotta duck out of the way. Good. How are you? I'm doing good. So getting right into your story, you grew up in Canada. What was your childhood like? Um, it was a great childhood. Um, I started playing keyboards very young. Um when I was four or five years old, my grandparents took me to their friend's house and there was a piano in the house. And uh, I guess I was able to learn um, uh, uh, Mary Had a Little Lamb pretty quickly. Uh, and so there was a little kind of, oh, maybe we should uh, do more of this. Um, and so my parents put me in piano lessons and I continued doing piano lessons until I was 13 or 14 and then I was like screw piano lessons I'm done uh <laughs> I, I want to go do other things um and then in high school uh I started playing with some friends of mine <clears throat> and we started a band and I started jamming with the band and then keyboards kind of piano started being cool again for me yeah, because uh, it wasn't just piano lessons. There was like an end to it, which was jamming with friends. Um, and then uh, graduated high school, went to music school, uh, or I enrolled in music school um, uh, in Toronto, which was across the country. I grew up in Calgary out west and then oh, wow. moved to Toronto, which was kind of the the easiest thing for me to get into uh, uh, out of high school. I was, you know, not a fantastic student. And so um, at the time it was like, oh, I can just play piano and get into college as opposed to like looking at my math scores, right. uh, which weren't fantastic. So um, I went with the path of least resistance and went into music school. Um, and that was awesome. And I met a whole lot of cool people. Music school is very like forced practice for me because I'm naturally a kind of lazy guy. So the the time and effort you need to like excel at an instrument, I uh, wasn't naturally uh, 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 driven to that. And so going to music school was like, okay, well, you're being tested on this in a month, so you better get practicing. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I can do that. Um, until the writing was on the wall for me, I wanted to get on the road. Uh, I just wanted to be on a tour bus. Um, and so I had that opportunity and I uh, dropped out of music school uh, and said, thanks for everything. I finished, I finished, like a year and a half, two years ish of of school, um, and got most of the sort of music related credits out of the way, and all that was left were a whole bunch of like English classes and stuff. And so I'm like, I'm not sticking around for this. I don't <laughs> right. need a degree for to to play the piano. So uh, I said, thank you. I'm out of here, <laughs> and went on the road and started touring um and uh it was clear to me that canada there was a bit of a ceiling there for um like if you're playing with a canadian artist that doesn't reach outside of canada if they only tour and play in canada um there's a maximum amount of shows you can play a year because there's a, it's a small population compared to the States. So the bigger the artist gets, 
the less amount of shows they're able to play because there's only 15, if you're being generous, 15 major markets in Canada. Mm -hmm. And once you stop playing all of the small little towns in between the big towns, if you're only playing the arenas in the big, big cities, then a tour across Canada gets done pretty quickly. Right. Um, so I was like, okay, I, I, there's more out there. So I was like, I need to move to the States. Um, and I was like, New York, Nashville, LA, those were kind of the big options. And Nashville seemed the coolest. Um, I knew a couple of people in Nashville. Um, I wasn't really interested in LA. New York wasn't my vibe. Um, and both of those places are really expensive. So yeah. Nashville at the time was even cheaper than it is today um, to, to live in. Yeah. Um, and so I um, picked myself up and went to Nashville and started touring and uh, toured with a whole bunch of artists until the road didn't make me happy anymore you know and yeah. and all at one point all i wanted to do was get on a tour bus and I, i'll play anything i'll go anywhere i'll do anything just get me on a bus let's just do the thing and then at some point i was just like i'll do anything to get off of this bus <laughs> get, get me off of the bus after you know after about 10 years of of doing that i was like okay i'm done with this yeah um when the road manager goes like, you guys are playing Jimmy Fallon next week. And I was going like, oh, it's going to be a 4 a.m. lobby call. Oh, it's an early flight. Oh, it's a thing. It's like when you're complaining about that, it's like, OK, maybe it's time to remove yourself from that situation. <laughs> um, so I got off the road and started playing sessions. Um, and that went well and i started doing that over the years um and there was a point where i was playing sessions and i was really lucky to get some of these awards and the the get the nod from your peers that you got you're doing great um and i was started to get worried that like do i do is this what i do for the rest of my life yeah. like do i just play keyboards on session like I should be so lucky that would be great but I have this like what's next kind of thing um that I like to I just get a little antsy uh if I'm stagnant too long and so I'm like I started having this conversation with a friend of mine who was a producer uh um that hired me for sessions whose name is Joey Moy yeah um we've all heard of him he's a brilliant extraordinarily successful producer and a fellow canadian and um he basically helped me out and was like uh you know i i kind of was like tell me about production how does this work and eventually that turned into uh co-production and we were i was working kind of for him with him uh, on uh, a whole bunch of records for a couple of years. And um, I did that for a, a whole, yeah, well, for a couple of years and um, started to branch out and I started writing as well. So I started writing and production and I was still playing sessions. And that's kind of where I am today, just sp spinning the plates. I'm trying to keep, all the things happening so one day i'll be on a on a recording session at a, a at another studio at a you know at a big tracking studio and the next day i'll be here at my studio writing with artists and the next day i'll be here working on a production for an artist so there's kind of uh, i get to do all those things now, kind of staying in your childhood for a second, who are some of the first like bands you remember hearing around the house that kind of made you feel a connection to music like early on? Yeah, I, I mean, my dad is like big into the Beatles and James Taylor and the Eagles. And um, I got into all of that stuff. Like I follow, I, I loved all of the music that he loved and uh 
so learning music from from him was awesome and then just learning music from the radio you know yeah. i was i was born in 85 and so in 1995 i was 10 years old and was listening to what was on the radio which was a lot of like max martin and a lot of pop music um and so that sort of seeped into my brain now, do you remember like when you were listening to records like in high school or maybe even playing along with them? Did you already kind of have that session musician mentality where like, what if I play behind here? What if I play ahead here? Kind of doing your own thing or kind of what was that like when you were consuming music? I didn't have that awareness at the time. Uh, I didn't know what any of that stuff was. It was just kind of playing by feel. Yeah. I wanted to learn. I was big into like fish and jam bands and stuff like that. So I would... My whole thing was I loved just like learning solos and learning. That was my practice. Uh, I would find a keyboard solo either in like a, you know, Boston with a uh, foreplay long time is like a great organ solo. That whole song is this big, long organ thing. And I was like, okay, I'm going to learn this. And so I would do that. And and um, that was the most helpful thing for me to like get things under my fingers and figured that out. And it wasn't until I started playing professionally, uh, like in band, in, in like as a side band in, in bands that things like time and feel and rushing and pulling and, and all of those nuances were brought to my attention. Yeah, because the drummer would. I remember the first time a drummer was like, "Hey, you're rushing a lot. <laughs> uh, just keep uh, listen to the click, pull it back, that kind of thing." I was like, "Oh, okay. I didn't know. Like, I didn't realize that was a thing." Yeah, I just thought, you know, the as long as I don't lose a beat on the click, then I was good. But mm -hmm. there's more nuance than that. So, so it turns out. When you first moved to Nashville, you uh, auditioned for Joe Nichols and get the gig. Tell me, uh, take me through that time of life. And what did you take uh, from your time with uh, Johnny Reed in Canada when you first kind of joined uh, uh, Joe's band? Yeah, I mean, um, that was the first time that uh, with Joe Nichols, um, I had moved here with the gig with Johnny Reed, uh, who is like a big, he's, he's a huge artist in Canada. And then you cross the border and he just kind of, he lives here in Nashville, but he's kind of lives a, a, an anonymous life. He gets off the plane down here and he's just Johnny Reed, the, the guy. And then he gets off the plane in Toronto and he's on a billboard up there and he's doing TV commercials and stuff like that. Like he's, he's a big artist up there. And so um, I was looking for uh, uh, an artist based in the States to work with. And so when I first moved to town, um, I was playing on Lower Broadway here in Nashville. I was playing, I was saying yes to anything that would come my way, playing little showcases, jam, open jams. There were a couple of like musician nights that were the place where all the road musicians hung out and that kind of thing. And so um, th through friends of friends that go, uh, you know, someone said, hey, um, do you want to audition for a band? They said, I already have a gig, but call Dave. Uh, he's new and is looking for something. And so uh, I got a call from uh, Dan Agee, who is, who's now a writer producer here in town. He was Joe Nichols band leader at the time. Mm -hmm. And Dan said, come out for this audition at uh, Soundcheck, which is like a big rehearsal hall here in Nashville. And uh, I auditioned and we jammed and I got the gig. And so, I mean, the Johnny Reed thing was very important for me to, like, everybody needs their first gig. You need your first gig to you know, figure it all out. What is life like touring? What's life like 
on the road? How do you carry yourself in different live situations? And so I was able to walk into the Joe Nichols thing, not a complete beginner to the road. Uh, I'd already been on a tour bus. I already knew how in-ear monitors worked and I knew how to program sounds that sound right and do all those things. So uh, I was new in town, but I had already had, a, you know, I had a bit of, I had some skills in my tool belt um, to, to kind of show up and, and do a good job. Totally. Now, what was that decision like to come off the road? You touched on it a little bit, but I'm sure it probably was a big like lifestyle change for you as well, kind of becoming a session musician in town instead of going on the road every weekend. Yeah, it was huge. Um, I needed, for me, I was a Canadian citizen. Um, so I needed um, a, a, a green card to live and work in the United States. And so to get the green card, I needed a sort of steady job. And so and then once you get the green card, you can kind of go off and do whatever you need to do. Um, but I needed that. And so once I, um, so my goal was to get a green card and my goal was to buy a house. Mm -hmm. um, and for both of those things to happen, I needed a steady paycheck basically to, to look good to a bank uh, 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 for them to lend you money. You know, they, they look for a pay stub. Um, and so um, once I got those two things figured out, um, then the road thing kind of became like a job. It was, uh, and I uh, just started noticing myself not being, you know, I was looking for other things to do. I was kind of bored. When you're on the road, you spend way more time, uh, uh, killing time than you do exactly. playing music. Hurry up and uh, wait. Uh, totally. Yeah. So, you know, I was golfing five days a week. I was, you know, and going like, I'm too young to be golfing five days a week. Like, <laughs> maybe there's something else I can do with my life. And so, yeah, so getting off the road was important for me. And then that process took some time. Um, but it's amazing how once you make a decision and actually pull the trigger um how people's perspective of you changes and once you call yourself a session musician then you're a session musician yeah you know you may be a session musician that's not that busy yet but there's no official you know you don't need a degree you don't need a certificate you don't need anyone to tell you you're a session player you tell them you're a session player and so with that attitude, I, on that day, I decided to be a session player. I got off of the road and um, that, that wasn't my uh, end to road touring. Um, it, was, it was almost like I didn't quit the road. I decided not to commit to one road gig. So I had opportunities pop up to go sub in for bands or hey will you do a this tour it's one month long we're going to play 25 shows in one month can you do it absolutely uh, 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 that helped me sort of pay the bills during my transition and then as that happened uh, uh, sessions just slowly started to pick up now, you've gone on to play on over 50 number one songs for people like Keith Thurman, Sam Hunt, Florida Georgia Line. Which songs stand out to you that you feel like you're most proud of uh, when you think back on all those songs? Man, um, I mean, there's a lot of, it's like, as a keyboard player, it's, it's uh, um, a lot of what you do as a keyboard player is a supportive role. Mm -hmm. So you're, there's a lot of pads, a lot of organ playing, a lot of, 